Hey y'all, welcome back to Bourbon and Bones. This is our 15th episode, and so if you're new here, welcome. Like, comment, and subscribe below. And if you're a dedicated viewer, welcome back. Also remember to follow us on Facebook at Bourbon and Bones, and Instagram at Bourbon in Bones. Tonight we're looking at a new product from Buffalo Trace, and just so happens to be just in time for Rosh Hashanah. And that is Buffalo Trace Kosher Wheat. Now this bottle was a gift to us from one of our viewers, Ed. So Ed, thank you so very much. We're really, really thankful for this. And so because of his kindness, we actually get to share this more with you all. So in this episode, we have several people to thank, and we're gonna jump right in with one of them with an interview. All right, so um, why don't you just introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. I'm, I'm Rabbi Jason Rosenberg. I'm the rabbi of Congregation Beth Am in Tampa, Florida. Buffalo Trace recently came out with a kosher bourbon, and mm -hmm. uh, one of my viewers was very nice to actually give me a bottle. And I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about what, it be, what kosher means and what it means to someone of Jewish faith. Sure. So most broadly, kosher just means acceptable or proper by Jewish law. So in theory, it's not just about food. A properly written Torah scroll is a kosher scroll, for example. But the most common usage of kosher is about food. And in the simplest answer, kosher food is food that is acceptable by Jewish law. And there are literally books written about all the requirements for different types of food. But an observant Jew would generally only eat something that falls into that category of kosher. So secondly, since Rosh Hashanah starts this weekend, and this is kind of what, and I'm sure I'm saying that completely wrong. I'm sorry. Pretty close. <laughs> Ro Ro Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. Close. Okay. Yep. With that starting Friday night, right? Uh -huh. Okay. Great. This comes live at 7 p.m. Um, in Arizona time. Yeah. Would you uh, kind of tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So uh, Rosh Hashanah literally means head of the year, and it's the Jewish New Year. It's the beginning of our of our calendar cycle. And maybe more importantly, it's the first of 10 days that are known as the Yamim Noraim, the days of awe. They're often called the High Holy Days uh, in, in English. And this is the most sacred time of year. It's a time we're supposed to be focused on Teshuvah, which means repentance, mm -hmm. on kind of a, a process of self-examination, looking what we've done wrong, where we've fallen short, and trying to commit to being better in the next year. My um... My best friend is uh, Jewish, and so I always get him a Hanukkah present. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I think a kosher bourbon might be might be on the menu for that. <laughs> I, I mean, I'd say almost any yeah. bourbon is appropriate for a present, <laughs> almost any time. So sure, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, speaking of that, what's your, what's one of your favorite bourbons? What's one of your favorite sippers? Uh, if we're going bourbon, I, th I knew you were going to ask me this. Uh, I had <laughs> one bottle as a gift one time of um, Four Roses Single Barrel, mm -hmm. and I just loved it. It was so smooth. There was so much flavor. Uh, that was probably a favorite. Uh, if we're going outside bourbon, um, Angel's Envy Rye is wow. probably my favorite whiskey in the world. I just, I love that stuff. I, I have to agree. It is one of my favorite ryes. It's definitely a dessert rye, but... Man, it's I'll, such a good one. <laughs> I'll, I'll fight you on that. I will have it before dinner. I'll have that during dinner. I will. The only reason I won't have it is because I want to save it because it's not out all the time. Right. Uh, but oh, I love that stuff. Yeah, that's a that's a great one. Absolutely, I I can't I can't agree with you more on that one. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. So I guess the last question is: um, Is kosher bourbon like is that kind of exciting for the community? Is that something kind of, or at least just, is it kind of a novelty kind of thing? It's definitely a novelty. Um, it really depends also on your strictness about keeping kosher. There are a lot of people who keep kosher who would have no problem drinking other bourbon or other whiskeys that aren't officially labeled that way. It's sort of, there are some foods that are inherently close to kosher, you might say. So you know, just for example, most people who keep kosher don't worry about their apples. Okay. Right. An apple is just kosher. There are some people that might want to make sure that it was that there, you know, weren't certain food products used on it or, you know, other things like that. But generally speaking, these foods are kind of default kosher. Okay. And so most people I know 
that worry about keeping kosher aren't really that concerned with the the, the provenance. The hexure is the is the term for the supervision over their whiskey. Okay. Uh, but there are some real concerns about uh, how whiskey could not be kosher. Mm -hmm. And there's really, there's sort of two major categories. One is it could have come into contact with something that itself wasn't kosher. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in theory, if the factory was using the same, you know, stills for something that involved, I'm sure someone's made a bacon flavored product at yeah. some point, right? <laughs> and so that, if the bur if the non-bacon bourbon, bourbon was in contact with something that touched the bacon bourbon, then that bourbon would no longer be kosher. Um, yeah. More realistically, uh, it could involve wine. There's really strict requirements around kosher wine. And even though we know that technically bourbon shouldn't be flavor altered, we know there are some bourbons that do age in, in other barrels like wine barrels. And so if that wine wasn't kosher, which most wine isn't, mm -hmm. and then the bourbons aged in there, then a lot of Jews who observe strictly, who observe keeping kosher strictly, wouldn't have that. Um, so the and the other category, which is the one I checked the website of, um, of uh, I'm sorry, is it Buffalo Trace? Buffalo Trace, yeah. Yeah, this, I checked yeah. the I checked the website of Buffalo Trace, and what they're focusing on is an ownership issue. Uh, okay. There's a holiday in the spring called Passover, Pesach in Hebrew, and one of the requirements of Pesach, one of the main ones is that we avoid all of five grains, uh, wheat, oat, barley, spelt, and rye. Okay. And not only can't we eat them, we're not supposed to own them. Mm. And so if a Jew owned the distillery, or I guess owned part of the distillery, mm -hmm. and th they're gonna obviously have a lot of those grains around, right. and they owned those during Passover, the fact they own them means that now that entire product is invalid. It's kind of one, it's been tainted with that uh, ritual misuse, let's say. Wow. So there's, a, there's a, a, a ritual, kind of a legal fiction that some Jews go through every spring where they sell off all of their grain products to a non-Jew mm -hmm. and sort of declare, this isn't mine anymore. And this way they can claim they didn't own any of these grains during Passover. And then the end of the week, they buy them back. Okay. And so Buffalo Trace is actually arranging for that sale, that sale. They're making sure that all of their grain products are not owned by any Jews in that time. Mm -hmm. And they get that kind of one week, eight day really window of, of non-ownership. Mm -hmm. Then they buy it back at the end and they can go on producing their bourbon all year. So that's uh, okay. a big part of what they're doing to make their bourbon kosher. Interesting. That's fascinating. I had, I had no idea about that all that process that's amazing i think that's actually all the questions i have for you uh do you have any questions any questions for me since uh you know what's a center. bourbon i sh what's a bourbon i should try Ooh, tough to try that's a good one. Ooh, have you ever tried the yellowstone bourbon? no never heard of it yeah that's a really good one it has lots of really good cherries on it um it's i believe it's weeded or a really low rye i kind of can't remember but it's a great bottle um, I think it's right around like the thirty-five, forty dollar range, okay. and pretty, pretty well, um, pretty much out there. Um, it's out of Kentucky. It actually, it's a quite a. It's actually a, has a lot of good history behind it uh, about why it's named Yellowstone, but it's in. It's from Kentucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I'd say, yeah, that'd be a really good one. I definitely would okay. try that one. Or uh, the new Pin Hook. It's a twenty twenty edition. If you like high proofs, um, they're pink lit bottle. Or if you like like the 95 proofs, they're orange bottle. It comes out of uh, Castle and Key. And those are kind of also my favorites for this year so far. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I wanted to thank you so very much for, for coming on here with us. And, uh, you know, sorry about all the time differences. I, yeah. I didn't even realize that I was looking at a map of Florida. That's how, that's how not good I am at this sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Well, thank you again, uh, Rabbi Jason. It has been an absolute pleasure, and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, talking to you again sometime, perhaps. Thanks for having me. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us and help us understand more about Rosh Hashanah and what it means to be kosher and what kosher bourbon is. So let's finally dig into the bourbon a bit. So looking at the label, see it's Buffalo Trace, it's kosher, it is crafted kosher by the Chicago Rabbinical Council, weeded recipe, and when you flip to the back, and this is really where it gets 
very interesting that it's their weeded recipe. No surprise, it's a weeded bourbon. But it not only does it satisfy Passover requirements, but it is 94 proof and it is the same mash bill as Weller, aged about seven years old, which means it's about as old as Weller 107, Weller Special Reserve. So if you can get your hands on it, it's actually just another Weller product by a different name. So without any more time, let's finally taste the bourbon. So right on the nose, you do get a little bit of ethanol, as you get with some of the younger Weller products. Just a touch, a little bit of apple, nice little touches of caramel. Maybe even honeyed caramel kind of combination. Yeah. On the palate, you get sweet caramel, oak, nice little balanced spice towards the end. Almost like a black pepperiness. And I think it's just a little bit of grassiness. Actually, it's a little bit more of an apple, like an apple grass, which I know doesn't exist, but it kind of reminds me of those two things. All right, so really fast, we're going to take a quick little break, let my palate rest. Add some water to this and let's see how it goes. Well, welcome back to Bourbon and Bones. We've taken a bit of a break and let my palate rest, got a little bit of water in the bourbon. And interestingly enough, as we were sitting here kind of talking and spinning it around, getting the, getting the water to, uh, to work into the bourbon, the girlfriend on the other side of the room was saying, I can smell that from over here. It's that powerful. And it is, and it's this great, already just this great smell of caramel, nice corn, and just a touch of apple. Even like this far away, it really, really fills a room, which is very impressive. But to get a little bit closer notes. And the honey that was kind of there before, really pronounced now. Great caramels, definitely that apple, at least, on the nose, this really, really opened up with a bit of water. It is a lot more oaky. Really more complex spices as well. Not just black pepper, it's like black pepper with white pepper in there as well. Cinnamon, I think. Um, a little bit of anise. Really, really brings out a much more complex spice build than I anticipated. Also a lot of, just a lot of good, sweet caramel. And vanilla, yeah, caramel's vanilla crazy spice bill. No grassiness, all of that is kind of left it and kind of almost ends in a bit of that sour mash smell. When you, if you've ever been to a distillery, you smell that angel share. It kind of finishes like that smells like. It's really pleasant, but it is a little um, sour-y. <laughs> So the verdict for the evening, if you can get your hands on it for $40, if that's its MSRP, absolutely get it. I, I know it's, it's a little hard to get a hold of right now. It's very, very popular. Everybody wants to try it. It has three expressions, the rye, the weeded, and something else. We'll have to fix that in post-op. 
if you can get it, it's definitely worth getting a hold of. I will say, I feel like it's a little bit different from the other Weller products. I, and I don't know that for sure. I, I know it's supposed to be the same mash bill as Weller, but it does seem to be a little bit more complex than like the Special Reserve, a little bit more complex than the 107. There might be some grain differences for it to be a kosher bourbon. I don't know that information really isn't out there. You know, Buffalo Trace is not gonna share that kind of depth of secrets. But I think if I were to put this side by side with a few of the other Weller in the same age range, I think this would do better. But maybe we'll try that sometime. Anyway, great bottle of bourbon. You, if you can find it for close to MSRP, absolutely pick it up. So for our final transition for the evening, we're gonna be talking about a dinosaur. This is the foot toe bone of an Montosaurus anitus. The specimen comes from the Hell Creek Formation in South Dakota. Now, Edmontosaurus means Lizard of Edmonton, which is actually the capital city of Alberta, Canada, where it was initially discovered and named. It lived in the later Cretaceous, some 66 to 65 million years ago. You may know this dinosaur by another name, Hadrosaur, which means duck build a name that I think most people are familiar with, the duck-billed dinosaurs. So Hadrosaurs lived alongside Triceratops and T-Rex and Albertosaurus, and one of my favorites, the Pachycephalosaurus, until the KT extinction event occurred. Link to that right here. So Edmontosaurus grew to an average length of about 12 meters or 39 feet and weighed about four metric tons. There are some exceptional, some exceptions to that. In the Museum of the Rockies have two specimens, ranging 15 meters, or 49 feet, and a uh, guesstimated weight of 9.07 tons. So nearly twice as heavy as the average. Now looking at my specimens specifically, you can see this deep groove along the front end where the muscles formed around and shaped the bone. There's also evidence this actually was a fully grown Edmontosaurus. You can kind of tell by this ridge here. It's a little, the growth holes within a bone, the more porous it is, typically the younger the dinosaur is. The more full they are, the older they are. Much like you see in people's bones. Because they actually get harder as they age. Thus, you get more stiff, and that's why when you get out of bed at 30, you groan, and you don't when you're 12. To show you where this bone is on the foot, here's a really good picture of a foot of an Edmontosaurus. So the fossil evidence of these dinosaurs overall shows that mass graves, which indicates that they moved in herds. They do move in herds. They lived, a, they lived near large bodies of water or coastlines, and they seem to be caretakers of their young by the nest evidence. So you'd see large collections of, of clutches of eggs and the shells have been well crushed, which indicates it's been lived in a long time, and tons of trace fossils. So footprints of Edmontosaurus adults along with little bitty Edmontosaurus children. You can find like oviraptors have actually snuck in, stolen eggs and buggered off quickly. Um, they, you see a lot, trace fossils tell you a lot about how dinosaurs lived. And through that evidence, we, we really feel like we can say that they were large herd caretaking communities. Very much like, mo similar to modern day cattle. There's also a great deal of evidence that, that Edmontosauruses were often attacked by T-Rex. So that kind of does throw the idea that T-Rex were only scavengers a bit out the window. Most notably, perhaps, is why so many people know duck-billed dinosaurs. And this Edmontosaurus was discovered and named by Charles March in 1892. Now this was during the Great Bone Wars. Out of this war comes the name of dinosaurs that most of us know today. T-Rex, Triceratops, um, Ankylosaurus, pterosaurs, um, long neck dinosaurs, all of those come from discoveries during this time period and the largest portion of them are in our lexicon today. 
So during this time, Marsh's Edmontosaurus was mounted fully bipedal with its tail dragging the ground, like, much like T-Rex was depicted for many years. But our evidence now shows that it was primarily quadrupedal, so it mainly walked on four legs. But it could also go long distances on two. So it's not too far of a stretch, but the evidence does show it was very back and forth, up and down, as needed. Now while this might have been the cow of the late Cretaceous, it is to us here at Bourbon and Bones still exceptional. And so is Buffalo Trace's kosher wheat. We want to thank you for joining us tonight and wish our friends in the Jewish community Happy New Year and hoping that your celebration goes so well. And we understand that that Rosh Hashanah begins this evening. Um, very sorry we didn't realize that until uh, we were well into post-op. So we hope you can tune in soon. Have a wonderful time with your family. And everyone, always remember, share a bourbon with someone. Good night.